Welcome to Broad Eye, the podcast that explores knowledge gaps in ophthalmology and eye care. Welcome everyone to another episode of the Broad Eye podcast. Uh, today, uh, we have a very special guest, uh, Jay Newman, which is a general manager, senior VP and head of US commercial at Spark Therapeutics. How are you doing today, Jay? I'm fine, Bruno. Thank you very much for having All me. Right. Do you mind if I call you Jay, keep things casual? Absolutely. <laughs> All right, cool. Thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, what is Sport Therapeutics? Like, let's start with that. Uh, if you could define the company and uh, state the, the mission. Sure, we're uh, what we call a gene therapy company. Uh, at Spark, our vision is to live a world in which no life is limited by a genetic disease. And we're proud of the work that we've done thus far with the goal of uh, ensuring uh, or working with the in inherited retina disease community. I'll be using the acronym IRD. Uh, and we aspire to seeing gene therapy reach its full potential. Uh, it's very aspirational. It's super uh, assertive and it is really cutting edge technology uh, in terms of what our lead pr candidate product Luxterna, which was approved by the FDA in December of 2017, Uh, and uh, we have a number of key values at Spark that are anchored on championing the patient. So everything that we do is about advancing patient access to care. And as we said, contributing to the aspiration that no life is limited by a genetic disease. And uh, how long the company has been operating? So the work on uh, our uh, gene therapy pipeline actually started about 20 years ago. Uh, Spark was rolled out or spun out as a company in 2013 uh, to take the gene therapy of the candidate to another level, which is turns out to be Luxterna. Uh, and uh, we had an initial pu public offering, offering subsequent to that spin out, uh, and again received FDA approval for Luxterna in December of 2017. And we're really proud of the work that we've done, uh, both uh, as being part of Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and then separately as Spark, to ensure that we are doing everything we can to advance patient access to care within the IRD community. Yeah, no, that is very impressive indeed. As, as far as gene therapy goes, it's, it's still rather new and a lot of people don't know exactly what that, what that means. And uh, could, we, could we maybe describe in as, as much of a late term as possible, you know, like, I mean, what exactly it, it, it is and, and, and then how the diseases are treated, like I mean, using that kind of approach? Sure. Sure. I think the, uh, the best way to describe it in the simplest of terms is that gene therapy and at Spark, we aim to turn genes into medicine, which is a pretty, uh, pretty easy way to describe an incredibly complicated process. Essentially, the brilliant uh, developers and scientists uh, at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, as well as at Spark, uh, came up with a way To ensure to engineer or uh, genetic material into what we call the AAV, the adeno-associated viral vector. In other words, utilizing a virus uh, as a means to deliver healthy copy of genes to the target tissue. In this case, with Luxterna, would be Luxterna is essentially billions and billions of these AAV vectors uh, that are that contain a healthy copy of the RPE65 gene that are in, that is injected into the subretinal floor uh, uh, in each eye of the patient and essentially creates the opportunity for the RPE cells in the rods which are part of the retina Uh, to give them an opportunity, give those, those RP65 cells an opportunity to read and code off a healthy copy of the gene versus a mutation. Uh, and what occurs when that exchange takes place 
is that the eye, the visual cycle of the eye uh, works in a more effective manner, uh, metabolizing uh, certain proteins that hamper the inability to see light at dimmer levels. Yeah, no, like that, that was pretty clear uh, to, to understand. Like, thank you. It's not, a, it's not an easy thing to simplify, right? That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> no, and I, I definitely want a disclaimer for, for, for the audience is that I'm not a scientist, right? I probably should have said that up front. Uh, I have a little bit, of, I know a little bit of science, but um, certainly I'm not, uh, I, I'm more of the, the business end. So I want to make sure that I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible. Exactly, man. That, that might qualify you better than a scientist like i mean to put it in terms that uh, like I mean, normal people can understand <laughs> <laughs> thanks bruno appreciate it and uh it is you know you mentioned already right it's been like hundreds of eyes that have been uh treated or could this therapy and then like some patients are already receiving the therapy on the on the on the second eye as well right like i mean so the, how <laughs> How, how, how this is going there like i mean it, it might be i mean the way i say it it's turning almost like a proof that it has worked in the first eye right otherwise patients wouldn't <laughs> like sign up the treatment in the other eye as well correct most most of the patients that were treated uh about 95 percent if not more uh slightly more than 95 percent have had two eyes treated um there have been instances where uh We've had patients that have had only one eye treated uh, because they were part of other RPE65 trials where those particular uh, therapies did not get FDA approval. So we had a number of patients who uh, received G a, a different RPE65 gene therapy in one eye uh, and that product was not approved and or that therapy was not approved by the FDA. So they, uh, their treatment centers uh, ensured that the contralateral eye was treated with Luxterna. So we had some one eye pa uh, patients that were treated or one eye treated in certain patients that fit that criteria. And uh, uh, so, so it's not really, I, I guess the best way to put it is that, um, and, and there were patients, I'm sorry, uh, that had the first eye treated and a small handful and decided not to have the second eye treated simply because of, uh, it's not a simple procedure. You actually have to go into the hospital. Uh, it's Luxdern is administered in the outpatient setting. The ophthalmologist has to, or the retinal, retinal vitriol surgeon has to do what we call a vitrectomy, which is to remove the vitreous gel, which is a very thick cell that helps hold uh, the back of the eye structure uh, in place and hold the retina in place, that has to be removed via uh, what we call a vitrectomy. Uh, and then air is pumped in to the eye to keep it shaped. And then the injection takes place. And then there's an air gas exchange or an air uh, fluid exchange uh, as the surgeon uh, uh, exits the eye with the uh, equipment necessarily to do the procedure. So it's not a simple procedure. Uh, and many, many, many of the patients that have been treated are uh, under 10 years old. And so uh, some families chose a small handful, chose not to have that second eye treated. Yeah, it's, it's understandable, right? And that kind of like dives into my next question because uh, there are other uh, uh, eye therapies that involves like just this, uh, an injection or right? an intravitreal injection. But in the case of gene therapy, the, the patients actually need to undergo a, a surgery, right? Like to place the, the vectors like in the right place, right? Correct. Correct. And that's the, that's the, I mean, there's a number of differences uh, between gene therapy treatment and traditional treatment. The first one is, is, that uh, in gene therapy, it's a one-time treatment, right? So, so the, the beauty and the uniqueness is that having gene therapy treatment, or at least Luxterna treatment, uh, I'll talk about Luxterna, is that it's a one-time treatment. So that if you are diagnosed with an inherited retina disease, the next step is if you are interested is to uh, be genetically tested to confirm what the genetic cause of the disease is. What, what is your genetic cause of your inherited 
retina disease. And there are over 270 different genes that cause inherited retina disease. There are 200,000 patients in the US that have IRDs. Uh, and we believe that there's about 12, 12 to 1500 that are RPE65 positive, 65 mediated, RPE65 mediated. So genetic testing has to confirm what the genetic cause is. And as you can imagine, uh, Bruno, is that the chances of being RPE65 are very, very small, but genetic testing is necessary to confirm whether you're a candidate for Luxterna treatment. Because again, remember my description of Luxterna is that it is a healthy copy of the RPE65 gene that replaces the mutation, mutated RPE65 cells, which causes the disruption in the visual cycle. So uh, it's a, a very uh, long and emotional journey to be diagnosed, to be genetically tested. If a potential patient is genetically uh, tested and found to be RPE65 positive, they are a potential candidate for treatment. They are then, um, if they aren't already in one of our 10 treatment centers across the US, they would be educated by our patient services team on what uh, treatment centers are available to them, which ones uh, do uh, accept their insurances uh, and would best meet their needs based on where they live and where they're willing to travel to if travel is required. And then they are booked, they book themselves a consult at that treatment center. And that consult is a pretty exhaustive one to two day evaluation of the patient's uh, ability to be successfully treated with Luxterna that includes target tissue viability. In other words, uh, is the retina healthy enough and viable enough to be able to accept healthy copies of the genes and that it's not destroyed by the disease? Uh, so again, very long, very emotional journey for the patients. Uh, if their retina is viable and can handle the therapy, they are then uh, given the choice of booking surgeries for each eye. Uh, the first eye is done and then the second eye can be done, again, in the hospital outpatient setting, uh, no less than six days after the first eye is done. And there are travels, travel restrictions and fly, you know, you can't fly, you can't drive over mountains, et cetera, because of the uh, nature of the vitrectomy and the subretinal injection. We wanna make sure that that patient remains stable and there's not a lot of, of, of variability in terms of the elevations that they are uh, uh, occupying. Yeah, no, that, that was a very clear overview of the logistics that come in from uh, they take it all the way, right? Like, I mean, the patients, like, once they have the desire, like, to submit themselves to the treatment all the way to the point that they actually receive the, the, the gene therapy, there's a, there's a screening process, right? So not everyone that has RPE will, by the end of that funnel, qualify, like, to receive that specific uh, gene therapy. And as you mentioned, like, I mean, there might be a road uh, uh, that, like full of emotions there, like I mean, for the ones that do not qualify and, and like miss out any step of the way. Uh, but like on the other hand, like it is not all lost, right? Like I mean, so once the, we understand like I mean, the genetic variation that that specific patient has, even if that doesn't qualify for Lux Turner, it, like I mean, it, it's, it, at least they know, right? Like, I mean, the genetic, genetic variations that they have and they might qualify for future treatments. Am I getting it right? Yes, you absolutely are, Bruno. You know, mm -hmm. let me put a bow around my, that last point too. It's really important uh, because uh, there, there are two things, three things. One is that the patient journey uh, is very complex and very emotional and a lot of ups and downs for the families and the caregivers and the patients. Uh, Spark does everything we can uh, to help support that journey through our patient uh, spark generation patient services that appropriately uh, supports and educates patients that uh, are potentially candidates for treatment. The second piece that's really important 
is that gene therapy is not indiscriminate treatment. We are not recommending that all 200,000 uh, patients that have an inherited retina disease uh, should be treated with Luxterna. It is only for the patients that are RP65 positive, and that is a big difference between the traditional, I, mean, I worked at other drug companies, say in glaucoma or chronic migraine, it was our view that any patient with a chronic migraine or glaucoma should be on the therapies for the companies that we work for. We are not indiscriminately treating a whole group of people. So the likelihood of success, once you've been diagnosed, genetically tested, and uh, had a consult, uh, our clinical trials uh, illustrate a 93% uh, success rate for the handful of patients that actually do qualify for treatment. So uh, it is really, really uh, not, I, the point we wanna make is that, uh, oh, and, it, and journey itself is very much more akin to an organ transplant than it is akin to a chronic drug treatment. So there, there is damage to the retina uh, and there are, there are misconceptions out there that you know, blindness takes a lot, low vision and blindness based on uh, the genetic defect is going to uh, take a while to manifest. And uh, we don't necessarily agree with that. We think that every day that passes that an eligible patient has to wait uh, could be detrimental to the retina, to the health and the viability of the retina. Regarding your, your comments on genetic testing, you're a hundred percent right. Ge having a full understanding of the genetic causes of your disease, whether you're a candidate for drug treatment or not, is incredibly important for a number of reasons. The first one that you said is just having, uh, having the knowledge of what is the genetic cause of the disease is incredibly powerful for those patients and for those families. Um, it helps to inform them in terms of, of, are there other clinical trials out there for other genes that may cause an inherited retina disease uh, that isn't RP65? So there's a number of trials out there, clinical drug trials that are taking place that uh, once they know what their genetic cause is and once, once their healthcare practitioner knows what the cause is, they can be better informed about opportunities for clinical trials. They can be uh, better associated with support groups for patients and families and caregivers who are seeking support. Uh, they may qualify for accommodations and certain services at the state level to help uh, assist them with uh, their low vision and blindness. And so there are a number of great reasons why uh, they, oh, and there's also aspects of family planning that people uh, typically like to consider. And once they're sure uh, of what the inheritance patterns are for the genetic cause of their disease, they're much more informed. And there are, uh, I think to answer your questions, many more reasons to be genetically tested than not. And genetically, and genetic testing uh, is still not well understood broadly across the healthcare field. Uh, and, uh, you know, that includes the health plans and the academic medical centers no, and a number of other uh, entities that sometimes believe, and in some cases believe that the only time it's necessary to genetically test is if there's a uh, genetic treatment for that disease. And I just laid out, based on your question, a number of reasons why genetic testing should take place uh, because there's knowledge is power. And once we know what the genetic cause of the disease is, it gives the patients much more options to understand what they can do to better manage both the short-term and the long-term aspects of these debilitating genetic diseases. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you totally. Um, going back to the uh, I, I believe Spark was the first company to have ever su successfully uh, delivered like a gene therapy for, for any disease ever. And how much has the landscape changed? Like, I mean, after that 
like milestone treatment? It's a really good question. Mm -hmm. uh, we were the first, Spark was the first to have a gene therapy approved in the US. Um, there's only one other since we were approved in December of 2017, that product's called uh, Zolgensma by uh, Novartis. And uh, it was a milestone event, frankly, because it was the first uh, gene therapy. It was also the first treatment for an inherited retina disease. One of the one of the biggest challenges that we have in championing a patient and driving better awareness of genetic testing is the fact that up until the advent of the Luxterna approval, uh, basically these patients were diagnosed with an inherited retina disease and most likely were told uh, you're going to, your low vision is caused by is is based on this inherited retina disease there's no treatment for it there's no treatment at all for the ird condition so we suggest that you go home and learn how to live a life of blindness so we have a lot of these patients out there that were given hope that there is a future uh, that could provide me with a treatment for this inherited retina disease or you know more broadly thinking based on your question my hemophilia or my pompeii disease or or other spark is along with a number of other companies uh, are focused on other target tissue uh, retina just happened to be the first but spark is also uh, focused on uh, liver directed gene therapy as well as the CNS uh, directed therapies uh, up to and including the lysosomal uh, storage disorder um, diseases as well. And so the advent of the Luxterna approval and frankly, the commercialization of it really did do a lot. It proved uh, to the healthcare market and it improved frankly to the investor community that gene therapy could be discovered, developed, put into clinical trials, have drugs safely manufactured for those trials, get approved by the FDA, uh, and, and get healthcare payers, uh, health plans to cover and reimburse for gene therapy to have the supply chain set up and have it safely delivered on a consistent basis and safely administered by a, uh, a set of treatment centers was all groundbreaking within the context of, again, uh, the proof that it could be done, uh, number one. And number two, it also excited investors, meaning attracting dollars from outside the healthcare market to invest in gene therapy to uh, be a potential solution to a number of other uh, uh, diseases that I kind of outlined around liver directed CNS, uh, et cetera. So, uh, it was really, really groundbreaking and gave the communities uh, a lot of hope continues to give the communities a lot of hope. And, uh, we feel really good about what we did differently, Bruno. Uh, we have, a number of values, as I said up front, and we anchor all of our values off of champion the patient within my organization, US Commercial. We believe if we advance patient access to care and we take care of the patients, that our business success will follow. It's not the other way around, right? It's take care of the patients, champion the patients, success will follow. Well, another one of our key values is breaking, breaking barriers, owning your excellence, and we were directed and supported by Jeff Marazzo and our senior management team uh, to include my manager, uh, our chief operating officer, Ron Phillip. Uh, we were directed and supported by them to do something different, to bring an, an alternative way of bringing Lux Turner to the marketplace that was different than what was currently happening. Uh, as I said up front, uh, Luxterna is a one-time uh, injection and the way that the, or one-time treatment uh, and based on the payment system in the U.S., uh, 
it doesn't necessarily advantage a product that is a one-time treatment because our system of reimbursement and payment in the US is that a manufacturer has to collect 100% of the cost upfront or be subject to certain uh, regulations around government pricing that are not advantageous uh, to, to running the business side of, of the therapy. So uh, we went out to health plans, we went out to treatment centers, and we discovered that uh, there was, believe it or not, some alignment between certain treatment centers and the, the, the health plans that we could get the drug into the marketplace at our cost and make it more affordable for the health plans and or employers that were paying the bill uh, and it allowed the treatment centers to acquire the drug without laying out a significant amount of money up front and then having to negotiate and file claims with the health plan uh, and have to wait for payment for the drug. So we were able to accommodate that, uh, that need and add a new alternative payment model to the marketplace called Spark Path that also included our ability or our willingness to also kind of stand behind the product, meaning uh, if the product did not work at certain points in time, because uh, remember it's it's a one-time treatment. So working at 30, 60, 90 days post-surgery is important, important, but we're also interested in what we call the durability of the product. How long is the product based on that one-time treatment going to remain effective? And uh, essentially what we did was we developed contracts as part of Spark Path that said to the payer, we will, uh, here are the certain measurements that will take place as a baseline, basically the patient's uh, ability or inability to see dimmer uh, levels of light. And then post-surgery at 30, 60, 90, measuring the efficacy or the improvement of the patient's ability to see dimmer light at that time frame, but then we also uh, asked those patients to come back at 30 months for the same measurement to show that that improvement, that initial improvement is durable over, over time. Because part of what we said with paying 100% upfront for this therapy, part of the challenge that Spark has, as well as other gene manufacturers have is, we haven't studied the drug forever, we don't know how long it's actually going to work. We know it's durable, but the system in the US is kind of forcing us to create a price for the product based on how long we believe it's going to work. In other words, uh, the FDA is approving uh, 21st century drugs and we are administering them in a 20th century payment model. Yeah, you, 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 you touched on an aspect there that like it's very unknown, like to the general public that like and to take a drug to market takes a lot more than scientists and doctors, like to, but a whole team of people, uh, expert on going through these regulations and and figuring out like the best and and feasible ways of bringing drugs to market, like it is. It is indeed that can be very complicated and that could be the subject of a whole other episode. <laughs> <laughs> well, it, you know, you, you had asked me about uh, other companies. I mean, gene therapy is re really, really hard work. First of all, pharmaceuticals, biotech development is super hard work. Gene therapy, in my opinion, after 30, uh, well, I've, I've been at Spark for five, I'm in my sixth year now uh, and I'm 31st year in the industry. It's hard work. Uh, gene therapy is exponentially harder because of the complexities of everything that we just talked about, the discovery, the development, the, the clinical trials, the aspects of safety, phase one, phase two, efficacy, phase three, um, having, having the product in a supply chain and manufactured at a reasonable cost of goods are all incredible challenges that every day you look at a news feed. Uh, there is somebody that is running into some difficulty along that development pattern that uh, really does hamper, uh, you, you know, bringing these products to market in an efficient manner. We're only at the beginning. You know, we're at the, uh, you know, you think about the evolution of the phone and the old crank phone with the two piece, 
you know, uh, headset up to your ear and you're speaking into a microphone. That's kind of where we are with gene therapy. And that over our lifetimes and into our children's lifetimes, we're going to see such amazing advancements. But right now, it is super hard work and we're only at the ground floor. So hats off to uh, Gene Bennett and Al McGuire and, Ka and Kathy High and all the folks that uh, uh, got everything started back in the day 20 years ago, 25 years ago, and all the pioneers in this space who have just done an amazing job of getting us to where we are. And now we're counting on the pioneers of the future to get us to where we need to be. Yeah, no, indeed. Uh... Okay, so we're starting to uh, wrap up. So given the obvious impact that uh, your company would have in the, in the, in the, in the blind community, uh, it is kind of natural like to see uh, the kind of partnership being established with, uh, for example, the Foundation for Blindness or like I Want to Know uh, and, and Spark. So would you like to just give some color on, on what exactly uh, those uh, partnerships uh, represent? Absolutely, and, and, and thank you for asking. So uh, our I Want to Know is our unbranded educational platform, and it is our link to the educational process uh, and uh, is there for provi healthcare providers as well as patients to seek more information about genetic testing and uh, inherited retina disease. And we're really, really proud of the work and the time that we're putting into that. As we said right up front, everything we do is about championing the patient and ensuring that they're educated and understand more about a really not well-known uh, disorder and disease and have all the facts that they need to know about what their journey could look like. Um, you know, it's a frustrating journey. You know, picture being a parent, which many of us are, and you have a child who is missing their development uh, stage gates. Uh, they have eyes that are flickering, uh, nystagmus. You notice that they're having trouble seeing at night. Uh, and you go to a pediatrician and the pediatrician pushes you to a pediatric ophthalmologist. And uh, that pediatric ophthalmologist pushes you to or at a retinal specialist or uh, 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 ophthalmology neurologist, uh, and, and people get lost in that, that journey. And so I want to know is here to help patients, caregivers, parents be able to better understand the journey, be able to better understand genetic testing and be able to better understand what types of support are out there. Uh, and so we're part of what we do is we have two genetic testing programs that we are really proud of. The first one is ID your IRD. Uh, and we call it IYI for short. And IYI is uh, a, a testing, genetic free genetic testing program that is administered by our lab partner in Vite uh, that is uh, test for over 300 genes uh, and we are going to be making some announcements over the next few months about some significant milestones that we've reached with the IYI program uh, with the support of, again, our friends at Invite that uh, are putting a significant mark on the amount of IRD patients that have been successfully genetically tested over the last 26 months that we have been doing the IYI program. Uh, so we've been doing the, the IYI program uh, with the multi-gene panel since June of 2019. Uh, and as I said, uh, with the help of our friends at Invite, we we're able to hit a pretty significant milestone this summer, which we will be announcing to the marketplace uh, in which we're really proud of it. Again, champion the patient and owning your excellence and moving moving the ball forward with regard to a better understanding of what the genetic causes are for their, their diseases. We're also this summer, or actually it was late spring, uh, also reached an agreement with Blueprint Genetics uh, to join and support the My Retina Tracker genetic testing program. Uh, that uh, is a partnership uh, with the Foundation for Fighting Blindness. As a matter of fact, our 
relationship with Foundation uh, for Fighting Blindness has really evolved in a very, very incredibly positive direction over the years that we have been uh, commercialized here at Spark. And we're really proud of the work that we do uh, in support of patients uh, and the patient advocacy group at FFB. And we're very happy to be able to provide for certain HCPs an alternative testing panel to, uh, to the IYI program via MRT. So there are some, uh, man, there are some uh, HCPs that either cannot or will not use the IYI program. And we believe that MRT is a great alternative for those particular uh, HCPs for whatever reason are not currently using our pro, uh, uh, the IYI program. So uh, that was probably a long answer to a short question, but in summary, we've got uh, really important and incredibly st uh, strategic operational and tactical relationships with the IRD community. Our commitment to the IRD community uh, is, is, is unwavering. Uh, we continue to uh, look to develop and or acquire certain inherited retina disease uh, therapies that will continue, like Lux Turner has, to make a real difference in the lives of patients and caregivers who are dealing, families that are dealing with uh, family members with inherited retina disease. That's great, Jay. Thanks for your time and and. and like the overview of uh, pretty much everything <laughs> the company the drug the, the patients and and like the the whole logistics of it all uh i think it was it's very useful like to give uh, all to, to all the stakeholders like a, a better understanding of uh, what it takes when i come in to to do what you guys do at spark so good job and uh, congratulations for everything well, thank you for that. And, and, and on behalf of Spark, we really appreciate all that you and Sean are doing, Bruno, to uh, advance the cause and uh, get the word out on how important the aspects are and the perspectives that we just brought are uh, to the low vision and blind community and ophthalmology in general. And, and frankly, I think uh, our biggest opportunity is to do more of these type of, of engagements to ensure that ophthalmology, if you think about it, you're an ophthalmologist, right? You, yeah. you are one of two disciplines that has groundbreaking therapy that actually does what, or strives to do, 93% uh, of the time does do, uh, uh, address the reason why you became an ophthalmologist, to preserve and save sight. And uh, we, we now have a groundbreaking therapy that strives and aims to do that, uh, in a very unique manner. And I think that uh, between Spark and the foundations and the patient advocacy groups and great programs like you're doing here will help get the word out uh, in that we get every patient, all 200,000 of those IRD patients genetically tested, those that are potential candidates for treatment move forward with their journeys uh, and that we provide hope and promise to more inherited retina disease patients and that we also uh, send a message to the broader healthcare market that gene therapy is coming and it is here to stay and it is going to be a difference maker uh, and, and for patients and caregivers and families alike. So thank you very much for the invitation and hats off uh, to you and Sean for everything, Bruno, that you're doing. Thank you, Jay. It was a pleasure sharing with you. Have a good day. Thank you. And that concludes today's episode of the Broad Eye Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Of course, ratings and reviews are always welcome. And you can certainly share this episode with any of your colleagues or friends who might enjoy it. Thanks for listening.